It's the Opperman Report. Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of New World Order resistance, high-profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman, and this show is brought to you by GetTheTea.com. Uh, check out GetTheTea.com, Life Change Tea. Let's see, uh, it's day number about 26 of the Daniel Fast. I've been on Daniel Fast now for 26 days, no coffee, no alcohol, no uh, sugar, no white bread, no rice, anything like that. I'm losing a lot of weight, feeling great. And I tell you, I owe it all to get the tea because I started drinking this tea. This is what got me motivated to get back on a Daniel Fast. I'm swimming every day. I'm hiking every day, losing weight, feeling great. Life change tea. You go to getthetea.com. It's not just the tea, by the way, when you go there, although the tea is great and it is life changing tea. They all kind of supplements and herbal remedies are for whatever ails you. So check out getthetea.com. You can also check out my book, How to Become a Successful Private Investigator at emailrevealer.com. And also to all kinds of services there, like the online infidelity investigation, catch your spouse cheating online, locates background reports, adoption investigations, asset searches, emailrevealer.com. Okay. My good friend, Mike Rothmiller, uh, contacted me, I guess, uh, a couple of weeks back, three, four weeks back. And he says, Ed, I got these, uh, F- oh, wait, Ed, Ed, guess what I got? <laughs> what I got here? He's always emailing me and I always look forward to opening up his emails. And he had documents, FBI, Freedom of Information Act requests uh, by, from the FBI about Chappaquiddick. And uh, he tells me, Ed, we're writing a book, uh, Chappaquiddick, The Killing of Mary Jo Kopechny. You can find that on Amazon.com or you can also find it in the Opperman Report bookstore. Uh, Mike Rothmiller, are you there? I'm here. Thank you so much, man. I, I always enjoy having you. You got great stuff. Uh, tell the audience about the, your, your uh, illustrious career there with the LAPD Intelligence Unit. Well, I spent 10 years with LAPD, and out of that, the last five years, I was a detective assigned to the Organized Crime Intelligence Division. And uh, basically what we did, we gathered intelligence on mob guys, politicians, entertainers, people that were of interest to the chief of police. Movers and shakers, uh, there was no need to have them involved in any criminal activity. We just gathered massive amounts of intelligence on them, much in the same fashion that J. Edgar Hoover did when he was at the FBI. Wow. So I guess you guys got a lot of secrets over there then still, huh? Uh, they More secrets than they, <laughs> they know that they have, yeah. And, and you wrote that book about the LAPD. What was that book called again? That was called... Uh, L.A. Secret Police Inside the Elite LAPD Intelligence Network. Excellent. and uh, But that was his nonfiction, and I just described, uh, well, based on my 10 years in LAPD, that I saw uh, the corruption, uh, brutality, racism, and so forth, but primarily within the intelligence unit, the illegal activities that were going on. And uh, basically, if you think about all the illegal activities that the FBI did under Hoover, Mm. Uh, LAPD was doing the same thing, black bag job break-ins. I witnessed black bag uh, job break-ins at uh, businesses, private residents. Um, I know LAPD, for a fact, was they wiretapped various attorneys illegally, of course, uh, because at that time, one, no police officer in California could obtain a wiretap for anything. There's just none. You couldn't get one. So LAPD keeping in the tradition that they've had for what well, that stage for about 40 years, they just wiretap anyway. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of interesting things going on, a lot of corruption, a lot of malfeasance. Yeah. You, and you talked about in our last interview, uh, a couple of last interviews about how Gates was a CIA, huh? Yes, he was, uh, which a lot of people don't understand uh, is the close working relationship the CIA's had for many, many years with law enforcement throughout the country. And I have documents on that. I've, been able to pull out the CIA and the National Archives where they would train selected law enforcement officials in various cities, whether it's sheriff or police, on how to wiretap, how to break into buildings, uh, how to use uh, lock picks and, and so forth, how to plant wires and bugging devices and everything you can imagine. And then uh, what they did is they recruited agents. And now there's a difference. There's the CIA officer and a CIA agent. The officer works directly for the CIA, and they're an employee there. The CIA 
agent is somebody they go out with and they either contract with or they just do it as a favor. And those people can be in private industry, government, police, anything in any business line. And uh, they may be working full time in a sense, or they may just be called upon periodically to do something for them. And what made it great for the CIA is that if you have law enforcement doing things, it doesn't come back on their shoulders because they're, as you know, they're prohibited from, for better terms, spying on Americans on U.S. soil. Uh, If you're off U.S. soil, you're fair game. But on U.S. soil, they can't do it, but the police can do it. So they would eh, basically farm out their activities within the United States, a lot of them, to local law enforcement. And what that was regarding Gates, Gates was a CIA agent for probably at least 20 years that I know of that I've been able to document. And uh, it was not only me, it was the SAC of the FBI office in L.A., the head investigator, the head FBI agent. Uh, We had a conversation probably, oh, I'm thinking five, right right after my book came out, L.A. Secret Police in 93. And he told me, he says, well, you know, Mike, he says, you know, Gates has been doing work for the CIA for years. A lot of your people in intelligence did. I said, well, I knew a lot of them did because. Some of the investigators would take off and they'd be gone for a month or two and uh, they'd come back and I'd, I'd say, well, where have you been? Because they showed that they were working and guys, well, I was in Nicaragua, another one I was, in, you know, in Guam and I was, you know, in Mexico mm-hmm. and all these other places running operations for the CIA. Yeah, I encourage people to go back and look at the old archives shows with Mike Rothmiller, uh, L.A. Secret Police. Uh, great stuff. Uh, we can go on for, forever on, on just that. Well, we're here to talk about Chappaquiddick today. But before we get to that, Chappaquiddick, The Killing of Mary Jo Kopechny, uh, your new book. Hey, what about what you, I mean, Anthony Pelicano is about to get out, right? And a lot of people speculate that uh, he might have been CIA because he had that device, you know, where you could wiretap people remotely. Uh, what do you make of that? Oh, Stingray? Um, yeah. Why, one, I didn't realize he was getting out soon. Yeah, no, uh, very sure. We got to watch what we say. <laughs> He's yeah. getting out any day, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's the Stingray, uh, a lot of well, a lot of law enforcement personnel had those. They they acquired them, and then some other people uh, acquired them off the black market. So, uh, just about anybody who had the money and understood what they were used for and how to use them probably could have gotten their hands on one. Yeah, but I believe he had the guy who had the patent on it. Uh, the, the patent, he, he, the guy who invented it, uh, worked for Pelicano. That I don't, I, I yeah. don't know, but it, it wouldn't surprise okay. me. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, do you suspect he was CIA too? He had some contact with the CIA for sure. Yeah, I, I had one dealing with Pelicano. Um, geez, you, you meant many years ago, and what happened was the remember, which was one of the uh, grocery store publications. You see, I won't give it any name, but they wrote a long article about me mm. and Michael Jackson at the time, and I'm looking. I said, one. I've never spoke to this reporter. I have no idea what they're talking about. And that's when Michael Jackson's going through his uh, trials. And uh, so I had to contact Pelican and say, hey, listen, uh, I don't know where they got this information. This reporter's never spoken to me. I don't know what they're talking about, quite frankly. <laughs> you know. And so uh, that was my only dealing with Pelican. And he was very nice and uh, very thankful that I called him um, so they can make some sort of move yeah. at that stage and demand a retraction or whatever they did. Yeah, he probably already had you tapped. You didn't even have to call him. Just, yeah. <laughs> just stand near your phone and talk to him, you know? <laughs> okay. Anyway, he did this book, Chappaquiddick, The Killing of Mary Jo Kopechny. Now, there's a movie coming out, and it looks like it's really well done. I saw the trailers. Uh, what is I the saw story? The movie. Oh, you saw the movie I already? Did. It's out? I saw the movie last week, yeah. It's already out? Yes, it came out uh, this past Friday. Oh, mm-hmm. I'll go check it out. So tell us, what is the story of Chappaquiddick and who was Mary Jo Kopechny? Well, Mary Jo Kopechny, she was a, a, basically the secretary to Robert Kennedy when he was running for president. And she was with him, you know, traveling around the country during his campaign when he was assassinated and so forth. And so uh, Teddy decided to, with him and a couple of his buddies, uh, have a party on Chappaquiddick Island. And so they rented a small house and uh, they went up there and they invited what they were called the boiler room girls in. And those were oh, all the, let's say over 18 to about 26, 27 
good looking girls that work for for his brother, Robert Kennedy, during his campaign. So I invited all of them up there to get together and just have a party and chit chat about his potential run for the presidency. So they were there on the island. Uh, Teddy was doing his usual thing. There was a lot of drinking going on. And uh, he decides to take Mary Jo for a ride off by themselves. Now, that's where everything becomes fuzzy because I saw some intelligence documents on it. And Teddy later on during the inquest and so forth, he says, well, he says, well, you know, I was trying to drive her back to the mainland and all that stuff. Uh, but what, what was happened is that he was drunk because he was a, a complete alcoholic. And there's no doubt in anybody's mind that he was taking Mary Jo out to try to uh, have sex with her. Mm. And so when they were driving across the island, a very small island, uh, he almost runs off the road one time uh, because he almost hits a police car coming head on. The cop just sees them. Teddy backs up, takes off, uh, just speeds away on a dirt road. Cop doesn't do anything. He just kind of shakes his head and goes about his business. And <clears throat> going down that dirt road was where the bridge was. And uh, Teddy went up on the bridge and drove the car off to the right side and the car went to the water it was upside down um what's interesting about it that's the movie follows that pretty well and uh teddy said well because i read a lot of his testimony that he gave he said well you know i i don't know how i got out of the car which he may not remember that's fine um but then he said he kept diving down diving down to try to rescue her and what was interesting he had basically said that he had dived down, but the windows were all rolled up on both sides of the car. The doors went open. So then you have to ask yourself, well, wait a minute, if all the windows are rolled up, Teddy, and the doors were shut, how did you get out? Right. You know, and he, he didn't know. But what all the reports show is that the passenger window in the front and the rear of the car were bro both broken out. The driver's side window was broken out, and that was all or down already from the impact. So there's certainly a way to get in. The water at that time, because the tide was at slack tide, it already receded and hadn't come back in yet, it was probably about, oh, four foot deep, if that, the deepest point. Really? Yeah, it wasn't that deep because the rear tires were, were completely sticking out of the water and there was the tide runs in and out through this inlet, but it was, I read the uh, inquest thing inquest report and it was that slack tide after it went out so it wasn't very deep and so he could have just reached down taken a breath kneeled down reached in looked in even though it was at night you know you don't have uh, a mask on or anything for diving you can't really see but you can feel around you can get in there and uh, did he do that or not he claims he did uh, nobody really knows but what is of interest in this I also remember this from reading LAT, LAPD intelligence reports is that they absolutely believed that she was alive for probably at least an hour after the car went in the water because it flipped upside down and formed an air pocket. Right. And she was basically in the back seat at that stage up in the air pocket. And uh, they made that conclusion because one, the way the car was, and they did a little testing, but also she didn't have water in her lungs, even though they didn't do a full autopsy. The people who looked at her said she was basically foaming at the mouth and through the nose. And that generally comes from asphyxiation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was basically covered up. That was buried. Um, it just, the, the whole thing stunk regarding Kennedy's situation. Uh, I pulled the grand jury testimony and now you've been to grand juries before sure. and I've testified before them and normally by the time if you're called in you sit down they say who you are you sworn oath blah 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 and you start to talk it's 15 to 20 minutes before you say anything well they pulled in four witnesses gave their testimony in 20 minutes mm. a total of 20 minutes now have you ever heard of a grand jury doing that <laughs> And that who were the passed. witnesses? His friends who who supposedly helped him look for the body. Who were yeah, the other witnesses? just uh, you know witnesses. Yeah, yeah. and uh, so you, you knew instantly 